Hello and welcome to Fantasy Football by Ben. Today I'll be hosting, this is my guest, Eric. Hi, <laughs> I'm Eric. <laughs> I've been playing fantasy football for a long time and I'm really into stats and stuff. So I thought it'd be, Ben wanted to have me on uh, just to kind of talk through some different players and stuff. So this will be fun. This will be fun. All right, I'll go first. So what we're doing is we're going to have like a, a flex option for you guys if you guys are struggling to figure out an option for your flex this week with all the bye weeks. Well, so I have Keelan Cole, and Keelan Cole's had two really good back-to-back games, and actually this year he's had really good games. He caught seven balls last week for 146 yards, and I think he's a good flex option this week. My next option is Adam Humphreys. Adam Humphreys is coming off a touchdown. He had COVID the week before that, but he caught a touchdown the week before that. So he's had two back-to-back touchdowns in the last two weeks he's played. Andy Isabella is kind of a iffy one because he's kind of a boomer bust kind of guy. And so last week he had zero points. And but he did get two deep targets from Kyler Murray, and they're playing against Seattle Seahawks. And Seattle Seahawks are the 32nd worst defense against the pass. So Andy Bell's Andy Isabella is a good play. Nelson Aguilar, he's been kind of a a low flyer. He's been actually pretty solid this year. Um, number five, I have Jeremy Mink- McNichols. He's been on the field a lot, surprising that Derrick Henry is like a bell cow back. And I think that he's a great play if you need a flex option. You want to say your five? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so number one, I have James White. And James White, I think, I guess maybe some people might think as an obvious flex play but he you know has only had three played three games this season uh but in those three games some interesting things so james white has has is already in the top 20 in targets to running backs this season in only three games played and then also in the top 20 in uh receptions and um receptions and receiving yards too so Really what that means is James White gets a lot of volume and will have a lot of opportunities. And I think uh, this week it's just, I mean, I think it's a good matchup against San Francisco. San Francisco's defense has felt somewhat underrated or overrated this year and hopefully should, I mean, I just, I just think James White is a good play. And I think as he's well, and I think uh, like you're saying, they're going to take Damien Harris out of the game. Right. You're right. And Damien yeah. Harris is, is a good runner, but that's really what he is. He's a runner and not as a receiver. And James White already is just kind of has that spot in the offense. Um, so the next I also have, I have Jamichael Hasty, And so Jamichael Hasty is running back on San Francisco, um, which so some people might not know who that even is. But uh, I just don't think Jarek McKinnon has looked that great in his touches. And I think his numbers uh, make him look like he's been a lot better than he actually is. Uh, so there's a part of me that thinks that Jamichael Hasty will get some solid work, uh, especially because Jeff Wilson is out this week, uh, who's kind of was been the backup for Jarek McKinnon. Uh, McKinnon will probably still get a lot of the passing work, which makes it hard. But I think that there is a chance that Jamichael Hasty could um, kind of blow up for some um, for some big runs and things like that. But uh, I think he's he's a good play if you really need are looking for someone like low. Right. And I think that's a Ben had a lot of guys like that too, where oh, yeah. those are, those are good plays. Like uh, Mick Nichols is another one who Ben said. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, cause um, he's not going to get touches cause that's what Derrick Henry's role is, but he's going to get five to nine touches in the last two weeks. He's had five carries for 51 yards and nine carries for 60 yards. Right. And he's been yeah. in during passing downs because Henry doesn't really catch the ball very much. Mm-hmm. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. And I think also Tennessee's offense has been clicking. So, Oh yeah. It might not be a bad idea to have a piece of their offense. Um, okay. So yeah, Jamichael Hasty, he's a pretty deep league fe- flex play. Uh, oh, and then I have another deeper league flex play in Brian Hill. Um, so Brian Hill is the backup to Todd Gurley uh, in Atlanta and they're playing Detroit and Detroit, their defense has been average at best this year but they have they've also had been pretty bad at times uh their pass defense is really what's pretty bad but their run defense has been not horrible 
Um, but Ryan Hill has actually gotten a pretty decent amount of work and his fantasy production this year has not been terrible. Um, you know, he's had, he had 15 points week three. He had so five he had touchdown. Yeah, he had, yeah, he did. Yeah. He scored. Yeah, he scored a touchdown and had 80 total yards. I'm going to say he had like a 20-yard rushing touchdown. Yeah. Yeah, and then week uh, five against Carolina, he had – I mean, he had seven and a half fantasy points. But what's interesting with Brian Hill is his snap share, so that's percent of um, snaps that he's been on the field for, uh, is – it's gone up pretty much every single week, and it's been pretty consistent now. So he's around 30% of the snaps have Brian Hill has been on the field for, which – is honestly like a pretty good number to look for. No, uh, Todd Gurley is still definitely he's playable. Probably like fifty though, Gurley. Yeah, yeah. So Brian Hill is actually not even playing that much lower than Gurley's. Uh, but I think Brian Will Hill can be a good play, mostly just because of Detroit's run defense, which has not been good. So Agreed. I think that there's a there's going to be an opportunity if you really need like are desperate for a flex play. I think Brian Hill could be a good option. Um, and then my next guy is AJ Green. And so AJ Green has pretty much let down every fantasy owner for the last, for the first five weeks of the season. Uh, even though he's been getting, he got an insane amount of targets. He just yeah, was he not producing that one game. Yeah. He is, he's had nine, 13, six, five, one. And then last week he had 11. Uh, but so last week was his first time actually producing, which I thought was convenient because uh, there was a bunch of time during that game that he's being covered by Xavier Rhodes, who used to be, a dominant corner and clearly has just really fallen off the map, especially last year on the Vikings. He was terrible. So that's interesting. Uh, but this week they're playing Cleveland and realistically, I don't think AJ green and it, and this is what's hard, but Cleveland doesn't usually shadow guys. Um, so usually they just have their guys on the side of the field that cover. And I think that uh, right now, AJ green is probably not the number one receiver on, the Bengals. So that opens the floor a lot for him uh, to produce. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think I, like, I think Terrence Mitchell will be covering him. So he's, and he's done a pretty good job. Um, most of the time he's, I think his, the completion rate that he's offering is really low. So uh, that, that could be a harder, harder matchup I'd say, but also that might warrant um, covering uh, Tyler Boyd out of the slot more too. So we'll see. Well, and um, Denzel Ward's tough. Yeah, and Denzel Ward's tough, but I think I also think he might be covering T. I think he lines up on like the left side though. Yeah, he's on the left, and then Mitchell's on the right. Because Greedy's out. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think AJ Green. I think That's that a good if you haven't trusted him, like he's seventh in the league in air yards. He's um, sixth in the league in most deep targets. And Joe Burrow does like to throw deep and likes to try for things. So, I mean, really, I think AJ Green is kind of a boomer bust type guy. And I think that as a flex play, if you're, especially if you're desperate, that's not a bad play. Uh, and then I know I've taken a long time to say all mine, but Zach Moss is my last guy. And so people are going to um, give me like a stank eye when I say Zach Moss, but here's the thing. So last week, when Zach Moss was back after injury, he barely played at all, all right? that We just should put that out there. He barely played. I don't think Zach Moss is better than Devin Singletary. I just want that to be on the record. However, Zach Moss was the only – he was the one that was on the field last week when they were in the red zone, which only happened one time the entire game. <laughs> but there was one time there when the uh, – the, uh, the, what is the team? The Bills. The Bills were in – the 10 within the 10 yard line and Zach Moss was the one on the field for that. So to me, that looks like he will probably be that. And he might have some serious touchdown upside. And also in week one, he scored over 10 fantasy points. Yeah. And he touched on receiving touchdown. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, he barely had any yards. Then everybody's like, Oh, and he had like three catches for 15 yards and a touchdown. And then he had like 20 yards rushing or 30. Right. So that's kind of where I think, yeah, I don't know. I think Zach Moss is a pretty good play. I mean, he obviously didn't do anything last week. Well, he's their goal line back, like you're saying. Well, and Singletary's been terrible at the goal line. 
Singletary has not been running well either. Right. And I think they're willing to like try. Yeah. And I don't see what, I mean, after them getting beat last week pretty badly. Yeah. I don't, I don't see why not. And so I think that he's another play play in deeper leagues. And they play the Jets on top of it. It's a big deal. So if, especially if they're winning early, that also might be a lot more running and that might also open the door for Zach Moss to get some work. So yeah, those are my five flex plays. So do we want to recap who they all are, Ben? Sure. Um, So mine were Keelan Cole Sr., Adam Humphreys, Andy Isabella, Nelson Aguilar, Drury McNichols. Yeah, and then mine were uh, Jamichael Hasty, James White, Brian Hill, AJ Green, and Zach Moss. That's good. All right, so you want to go to – so we both ranked our players. We did, like I was saying in my ranking videos, which you can go watch if you haven't yet. Um, I ranked the quarterbacks 1 through 20, running backs 1 through 25, wide receivers 1 through 30, and then tight ends 1 through 15. And Eric did the exact same thing. And we compared. And so we're going to look at the difference between like a far range of players that we ranked. And we're going to talk about why we ranked them, where we ranked them compared to to each other. So first we're going to start off with Tom Brady. Adam ranked 12th. Eric had him ranked 18th. I had him ranked 12th because the Raiders are not a good pass defense. And I mean, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, I feel like they got to click at some point, all three together, and Gronk's kind of getting in the groove. So I think Tom Brady's going to top 12 play this week. Why'd you have him ranked 18th? Yeah, so honestly, I had him 18th because I think he's overrated, <laughs> uh, which that's just an opinion. But mostly, um, I, I just felt like there was a bunch of guys that I had a hard time putting him above. I think – that I, I mean, I definitely agree with you that Las Vegas uh, does not have a great pass defense, but I also think that I think that there's two things. I think that either a, there's a chance that the bucks could be up by a lot early uh, because their defense is so good. And that makes me wonder if Brady won't throw as much in this game. But they were uh, up early I, against the Packers and they still threw. That's and true. Brady- I mean, he threw for three touchdowns last week. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. That's true. I, I just – I also think that – But they were behind 10 nothing in the, in the first. Right, yeah. And that was – and I, I do think, too, like their defense – or their offense against the Packers got were really slow to get going. Yeah. And really, it took two uh, huge defensive plays by them. To really for get them, yeah. them to even get going. And the offense the, for the Buccaneers still didn't get going. And then they scored right. a touchdown on their, like, third drive of the game. Um, well, no, because so, they picked it off and got tackled on, like, the one. And then Rojo right. ran it in. Right. Right. And then they're yeah. up 14 to 10, and then their offense started clicking. Yeah, so it was, it was pretty slow. And it I think – really slow. I mean, overall, like, I think Brady, like – I mean, he, he's been, he has all the opportunity and like the passing production to, to realistically be a top 15 quarterback. And even, I mean, a top 12 puts him at as, as a QB one this week. Um, And I don't know, I guess, and maybe it is just, I just feel like there's 12 better starts at quarterback. Um, Maybe there are. And then plus six, (laughs) but I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's just, also, just me talking. I just – I have not been as impressed with Tom Brady this season. I mean, uh, his fantasy numbers aren't great this year or anything. I think that just, like, the fact that he has healthy Chris Godwin, Gronk look great, and Mike Evans, I think is going to help his case this week against the Raiders. Because the Raiders have beat the Chiefs already this year. They put up points, you know? Yeah. I just don't know what their offense is really going to be like because – Will they take away Darren Waller? You know, because if because Tampa Bay's linebackers are good. That, that, I mean, they are really good, and they're really good in coverage. Really good. Well, and so, okay, so maybe this is a better, a better, a good way to put it. I think that Tom Brady. So he hasn't 
like what you said, he has not been that reliable. And I think that is probably getting to me more than anything. But also when looking at his fantasy production and then actually thinking about it. So Tom Brady has actually produced the best in, in games that he has been pressured which that is Tom Brady, right? I mean, he's a yeah. he's really, really good quarterback under pressure. He gets in the pocket and throwing it. Right. And so I think what's hard for me is in games that he hasn't been put on pressure, he hasn't needed to throw well. <laughs> and okay. I and I but think that's said, where it's hard because I don't think he's going to play the Chiefs. That that was the most times Patrick Mahone was pressured this year. Yeah, I mean that's true, and they also, but I also do think that they were game planning to do that. Oh, no, I 100 percent agree. Um, but that's how you beat Patrick Mahomes. But also, so okay, so here's some. So this is just for mostly for the listener. I, I mean, I think Ben has probably looked at this, but so the Raiders this year have have averaged actually only 16 fantasy points per game through the air, which is how Tom Brady gets all his fantasy points because he passes. He's not really a runner. And the sneaks though, really this, well, this is what it says though. So Tom Brady. Oh, okay. So the reason that the Raiders have been giving up so little amount of, or so little amount of fantasy points is because they have not been allowing passing. So they've, they've been allowing so many rushing touchdowns. Uh. (laughs) Ah. So what that means, though, is that there's less likely to throw touchdowns. And the quarterback or touchdown rate against the Raiders this year is only a 3.95. It's really low. Yeah, which would be the 26th ranked quarterback this season in the NFL. So because of that, there's a chance that Ronald Jones blows up, goes off, and then Brady doesn't I do think like he has the opportunity to have a high like a high ceiling but I think his floor though is also really low so that makes me push him down to 18 and realistically the things that I just said are the reasons that I put him lower than where Ben has him but I do also hear Ben what Ben's saying too so really that's up to you all right so then now I'm going to ask you about Jared Goff because I didn't rank 20th and you didn't have him ranked at all I'm just curious you said it was the Bears' defense. Yeah. But is that it? Um, Because I ranked him at 20 because, I mean, he's had two bad weeks in a row. Struggled both weeks. And because they played the Giants, right? Wasn't that two weeks ago? And they only supported 15 points. Uh, Washington. Washington? They Washington, he scored 24, and then the Giants, he scored 11. But that was week four, was the Giants. Okay, well, last week was good, but it was against Washington. But, I mean, still against San Francisco, he looked really bad at points. And, I mean, I think that Jared Goff, I think this would be a good bounce-back game against the Bears because the Bears, their defense is actually pretty good. But I feel like, Jared Goff has so many weapons. It's kind of like um, maybe it's not Jared Goff per se, but it's Sean McVay. Like Sean McVay is a good offensive coordinating coach, and I think he'll come up with certain plays that will help Jared Goff this week against the Bears because he knows what the Bears have run because they played him three straight years now. Although I did hear a stat today that Jared Goff is zero touchdowns and five picks against the Bears in the last two years. Mm-hmm. So that makes me worried. And maybe I would not rank him now, but I just didn't know who to rank ahead of him, if that makes sense. So, like, I like the matchup with Jared Goff this week, but also at the same time, I wouldn't be playing him if you don't have to play him, you know? Well, and for, for the listener, too, here's what – because you guys don't have our rankings in front of you, but here's – so when Ben says that he didn't know who to put ahead of Goff, so I put Kyle Allen and, and Andy Dalton both ahead of Goff as I well as Dalton at 18. Okay. Oh, where do you have Goff? 20. Oh, you do. Okay. But I also, I mean, and I don't know who well, Ben Kyle has. Allen was a good play, I think. That's a good, that's a yeah, good. Yeah. So, so really, I put Kyle Allen and Andy Dalton both ahead for me. But so here's my, this is my biggest stat that I care. So the Rams are only 29th in pass plays per game. 
So they're only averaging 32.8 pass plays per game this season. Um, and so for me, I think that already really limits Goff's production ceiling. So a lot of the numbers that Ben was saying about um, his fantasy production, I think that part of the reason that he has had down weeks is because of that number. And also, in the games, do you think though against like a Bears defense where they might be behind, they might be throwing more. Well, so here, okay, so maybe, but also I, I don't think the Bears defense is, or I don't think the Bears offense is nearly good enough to be, like I think that the games that they won this year were all close. Well, and that was funny also because they were saying that the last games that the Bears and the Rams have played have ended six to fifteen, and. It was also really scoring, low scoring one. It was like 18 to 10 or something like that. Yeah. Well, and the thing too with Goff is, and I, I definitely think that he has improved. This is clearly the best he's ever been as a player. But I also think, so in the games that he has been, that he has produced in fantasy. So that's against Washington, against Buffalo, and against Philadelphia. So in those three games, he's had really good fantasy days. He was the 10th ranked quarterback in fantasy, the fifth ranked quarterback in fantasy and the eighth ranked quarterback in fantasy. And so in those games, those are all startable numbers, right? Yeah. But in those games, he was super efficient. So they still only, he threw 27 passes, 32 passes and 30 passes. Okay. And in those games, in the 27 passes was against Philadelphia. He had a 74% completion percentage. The next game, 32 passes, 71.9%. And then the, the game against Washington was 30 passes with a 70% completion percentage. So in all those games, he was like hyper efficient. Yeah. And that's why he scored so well in fantasy. But then in the games that he didn't score well, were all the games where he threw still only around 30 attempts, which is not great. And then had really poor completion percentages in those games. And especially San Francisco, which he had the most pass attempts was 38. He... And that was, that was a game that they were like, he just really struggled in, but he only had 50% completion. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I think the bears have, I mean, obviously have a great defense, but their pass rush is really strong. And Jared Goff does struggle in that. Um, But then I also think that he has been able to be really efficient against teams that don't have great pass defenses. And I think that against the bears, that could be a problem. So for me, it wasn't hard to drop him out of the top 20. And I would almost say borderline unstartable in that way for me. Um, and maybe you having met 20, realistically, you're saying that too. Well, I'm saying he's unstartable. Yeah. I wouldn't start him over. I wouldn't even start him over like Minshew this week or someone like that. Right. Right. And it, you're, but you are saying, cause in a two quarterback league, you are saying that he is a start as a quarterback too. I would start him in a two quarterback league, but that's also because in a two quarterback league, I try. I would maybe not like this week, but I'm playing Jared Goff every week because I have him. You know. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I think for me, and I guess that's maybe where I'm going with it, um, because I think in a two quarterback league, I would still think that I could find like Kyle Allen. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I just think I could find other guys that. One, um, that's probably a good point. Yeah, but. Anyway, okay, we can we can move on. <laughs> All right, um, that was so way too long. Carson ranked sixth, and I had him ranked thirteenth. See, I was going up against the Cardinals. Right. Cardinals yeah, so, has been good. So why are you lower on him than I am? Not to say well, that you're necessarily. We can also bring up James Robinson because we basically had James Robinson and Chris Carson flipped, and so I. Robinson at six and you had Robinson at 13. Basically why I had Robinson further up ahead over Carson is because Gardner Minshew loves throwing the ball to James Robinson. And so last week, James Robinson had a receiving touchdown that helped him out, you know, but I think Chris Carson is a better runner, but I think the Cardinals defense is better than the Chargers defense this year. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I had James Robinson at six because I think he'll do more this week because they have a chance of being up in that game. And I also think that Chris Carson won't do as much because I think that game's going to be a shootout passing. 
because the mm. Seattle Seahawks defense won't be able to keep up with the Cardinals offense. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think maybe Carson will catch – like in week one, he had six carries for 21 yards, but he had two receiving touchdowns, you know? Right. And maybe he'll do that again. But I think that's pretty unlikely. Maybe. Well, so – and because it, it's funny you're bringing up that stat because I would say – so Chris Carson, historically, we haven't necessarily felt like he has been – I mean, it hasn't always felt like he's been a three-down back. But, like, realistically, he, had, he has produced that way, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and sure. especially this season, I mean, he has what? Like, he has over 20 receptions this year. And, like you said, like, he produced – he had two touchdowns receiving in the first game. So, here's my biggest thing with the Cardinals. The Cardinals are one of the worst defenses to pass catching running backs, which is kind of what you were just alluding to right before that. And so, my biggest thing is I do think that Carson might really struggle on the ground. But – I also do think because Seattle's offense is so good, because they'll be passing so much, I think that there'll be plenty of opportunities to check down. And I also think because, the, and the check down because of the Cardinals pass rush is really strong. Um, but I think that Carson has done, has been one of the most efficient running backs this season um, because he only ranks. So this is an interesting stat I found. He only ranks 17th amongst running backs in opportunity. Okay, so 17th only, but he is literally in the top five running backs this season. Yeah. So what that means then is that he has been one of the most efficient running backs with the carries and the touches that he's gotten. Um, and so I think that that definitely relates, translates into, where, in, in, into his receiving work. Yeah. And so with his receiving work and because of the Cardinals poor receiving um, defense to running backs, I think that that will, that is a big thing for me. And that to me is a reason to put him in the top 10 running backs, just because he has such a high upside in the receiving game this week. But you don't think James Robinson does? Well, okay. So then that's the problem was, is that Robinson is going up against a weaker defense. And so I think he can get it going on the ground game, but he hasn't the last week, two weeks. Well, the last three, the last or three of the last four weeks, he hasn't had over 50 yards rushing. Yeah, I was going to say against Miami, only at 46, but he had two touchdowns. And he caught like eight balls for 80 yards. Yeah. Well, and, and it's not putting James Robinson at 13 to me, I think to like the fantasy community could seem like a slight a little bit, but I think that really for me, like 13 is still, I mean, that's, I mean, he's that's not in the top back one. Right. So he's on, he's high end RB2 for me. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I just think the Chargers defense has been good. And I just, with James Robinson not producing the way he did in the first two weeks. Yeah. No, that's fair. That's just my, that's kind of my, my push down. And I just also, I mean, for the listeners, because I have Todd Gurley, Ronald Jones, James Conner, Mike Davis, Joe Mixon, and Clyde Edwards Alaire are the ones in between Chris Carson and James Robinson for me. And so really for me, it was just, I just was able to, I just felt like I could keep putting those guys above Robinson just because I think that their floor and their ceilings, maybe their their ceilings might not be higher, but I think their floors all are. And that was easier for me. Whereas Robinson in the last couple of weeks has shown that his floor has not been as high as we had initially thought, Um, which doesn't, isn't to say that he still isn't an, an obvious play. And realistically, if you have him, you should be starting him unless you have probably two of the guys that I said that I read before him, <laughs> but yeah. anyway. Um, so then we got Justin Jackson. I don't have him ranked. You have him ranked 20th. I do. Do you explain yeah. why? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So Justin Jackson, I put in my, at number 20, which I guess you could say then is in the top 20, which puts them as an RB two. Uh, really? I think. So, okay. So for, I think to, for, to understand the Justin Jackson ranking, I think you have to understand the Joshua Kelly, That's right. in my opinion, yeah. so far. So I, I was like super high on Kelly, like early in the season. I thought in game, the first game of the season, I thought he was amazing. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Ben is a diehard Eckler fan. So he uh, also knows this, that Kelly was really impressive because he 
was he probably worried. Carries. He was worried that Kelly was going to take Eckler's <laughs> some of Eckler's production. But this is this is the biggest thing for me. Jackson. So Jackson only out touched Kelly eight to by eight touches. He had twenty to Kelly's twelve. But Jackson was just a beast. <laughs> like he and he's. I think I think my biggest thing is he is a actually like a good receiver. And it's funny to me because I saw like watching the game last week. Was it last week? Yeah. Yeah. No. No, two weeks ago against the two Saints. Two weeks ago. Yeah, because they had a bye. No. Um, but watching Jackson play, I think that he was really impressive. Um I think it's funny too, because after losing Melvin Gordon, I think there was this thought that, you know, could Eckler be that guy? But now it's funny because the worry is okay, so if we lose Eckler, can Jackson be that guy and I would say yes like it's just they yeah. have a very sustainable backfield and I think well, that and Jackson back well yeah and Kelly's he's good young. I think my biggest thing is that Kelly just has not been producing as of late and his oh, yeah. like yards per carry is a really bad statistic and oh, that's yeah. for the fans like... at home don't look at care about that stat yeah. however with that being said Kelly has just not produced pretty much at all in the first two games of the season, he had, I think, a couple of big play runs where that was why everyone was so hyped on Kelly. But then after those first two weeks, he just really has not done it. And yeah. because of his lack of passing down work and they, the Chargers and Anthony Lynn's offense just check down so often and run the screens and run, you I know, mean, those. Eckler had 11 catches that one week, you know. Yeah. Well, and that – so. And, this- Jackson can do that. Well, right, exactly, exactly. Hope maybe I just convinced you, Ben, to put him. <laughs> I mean, higher. maybe I would. I'm just, I'm just worried that Kelly's going to get more touches near the goal line as well. I think Jackson, Jackson, I think could do goal line carries, but that's just never like that's Kelly's role, you know. In that offense, is he's their goal line guy. Yeah, no, that's I, that's true, and I. And I do want to say too, like this, like for especially for the listener, like the Saints do have a good uh, defense, especially against just running backs as a whole. So receiving and running, because um, I think what did I see? They're al- only allowing they're allowing less than one PPR, PPR point per opportunity. So that's uh, pass or point per reception. So they're they're averaging in a point per reception league they're averaging less than one point per touch which that's really low <laughs> so that's good that's like a top five negative yard almost right so that's that's like a top five uh stat and so i'm not saying that that mean that doesn't necessarily prove that the saints have a good defense necessarily but it just means that it's been really hard to score fantasy points against them and so i think that that's definitely something to look at because Justin Jackson is the PPR guy, whereas Kelly might be more of a start in a standard league, um, especially if you're looking for the touchdown upside. So I think that's definitely something to watch out for. But for me, Agreed. I think that still warrants Justin Jackson as a like an RB2 this week. And I think if you have him, I think if you have him start him, Ben might say you should look at other guys that you have too. And I would say he's a good flex them. option though, for sure. I wouldn't say like he's a running back too, but I would say that he's a good flex option. Yeah. Like maybe I would consider putting him at like 25 now. Where like he's just outside of the running back too. Right. Um, okay, let's go to our next guy, which we're starting wide receivers now. DK Metcalf. I had him at eleven, you had him at four. Yes. I'm at 11 because the Cardinals have actually been really, really good against receivers this year. But also maybe it's the competition that they've played. Although Kenny Galladay, when he played against them, he kind of did pretty good. Yeah. But um, yeah. I think – so Patrick Peterson will most likely be on Matt Calf, right? Because he shadow, he's shadowed this year. Peterson – and yeah, I think he's the most likely guy to be on Metcalf. So that's, I well, I, okay. I think that's absolutely the question, right? If Patrick Peterson is shadowing Metcalf, I think that does definitely bump him down. 
and I, but I do think that DK Metcalf is p- probably one of the least shadowable receivers in the NFL. Oh yeah. Just because of his size and his athleticism. His, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. And, and I think the Cardinals, cause, cause you are right. Cause last season, the Cardinals had like one of the worst pass defenses in the NFL this year, it has been significantly better. Um, and they've also, if you look, so I was, I was just looking through like the different teams they played. So the last teams that they played, Washington, Detroit, Carolina, and Dallas all have really top heavy wide receivers. If you think about it, cause they have that DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, Amari Cooper, Kenny Galladay, and Terry McLaurin. All of those guys have been producing as well, upside wise wide receiver ones and then also they've had Jam- Jameson Crowder who has been a wide receiver one in games he started this year yep. so they so with that being said they're only scoring the third lowest or okay well third so they've best. been giving up 7.43 yards per target which is the third lowest in the NFL wow um so that's pretty good um well, but Crowder runs out of the slot well, right, and and that is part of what I, and I guess more what I'm just saying though is the Cardinals' defense with good. that number, the Cardinals have been that good with all of these wide receiver ones, and so what is going to be different then with DK? But I think you can also argue mm-hmm. that DK and um, Lockett. Lockett are both wide receiver, well, borderline wide receiver ones. Um, so I mean, I don't know. Yeah. That's something to think about. But also for me, a, the biggest part of it, it's just the Seattle. It's Seattle's offense. Oh, it's Russell just really good. And Russell Wilson's really good. And I just, really I think. Ball. But I think that's going to help that the Cardinals are going to prepare for that, you know? Well, I mean, yes, absolutely. That's but, definitely I true. mean, Gilmore was covering DK Metcalf and everybody's like, oh, Stephon Gilmore is like the best corner in the league. And then DK Metcalf still did his four for a hundred and touchdown. You know, right? Exactly. Because he's averaging almost. He's probably is he like top of the league in air yards or no? I didn't look. He's he is fifth in air yards. Yeah, which is one hundred thirty two point two per game, and then his air yards share, which is probably a better stat for because then it's just talking about the amount of air yards the team has had. He's yeah. third in the NFL in that. Wow. Um, and then if just for the listener, if they're interested in some other interesting stats. Uh, DK is fourth in the NFL in deep targets. And remember, they've only played five games because they've already, they had the early bye. Yep. So he's fourth in the NFL in deep targets with only five games played. Um, and that's with 13 targets. And then he's also um, been on the field for every single, every single pass play this season. And he's second in the NFL in snap share, which there's a lot of players that are second in the NFL. He's tied with them. Um, but so, yeah, he's just been, I mean, he's just been producing with the, the, what he's gotten. I would say his biggest downfall is definitely receptions. Uh, cause he gets targeted plenty, but really he has not been, um, the no, most efficient. High receptions this year is like six. Right. Well, yeah. And his target rate is only 21%, per, which is 67th in the NFL. So yeah. that's not a good stat. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's also hard with David Moore and Tyler Lockett on your team. Yeah. Um, well, and so, Chris Carson, like we were saying. Yeah. Yeah. I just think, I think that this might just be one of those boom weeks for DK. And really that's why I have him ranked there just because I, I have a feeling that Arizona can keep up and I think it's just going to be a really high scoring game in general. That's very true. I think so. And so, and usually in the, if you look at the games that have been the highest scoring for Seattle, DK has done the best. Um, so, and granted, I mean, it's hard to say that he's ever even not done well because his lowest scoring oh, yeah. week was 14.6 points. So, but anyway. All right. Yeah. We're going to talk about Amari Cooper now. I have Cooper at 10. You had Cooper at 15. Dallas is playing against Washington this week. Why did you rank Cooper so low? Um, Well, I would say that I don't really trust Andy Dalton. <laughs> and that's Is, probably going to be like the same thing with Tua next week where we're probably going to have Devontae Parker in like the top, in like the 20s because we don't know what Tua is going to do, you know? 
I mean, Ann Dalton in his like career has proven that he can throw the ball to a wide receiver one, but he's really only proven that he can throw the ball to a wide receiver one. And they have three options between God or Gallup, Lamb, and Cooper. And so far he's shown that he's favoring Lamb to me. But I think this would be like a Cooper game for sure. Although Washington's actually been really, really good against the pass this year. Yeah, they have been. Well, and I do think – Um. so I just thought – I just felt like that just looking at stats and like all of, like all of the different receivers, like advanced stats especially, that Amari Cooper – was just I mean he clearly produced lower with Dalton but so did CeeDee Lamb even I mean in CeeDee Lamb well yeah because he was targeted a bunch but um I don't know I guess okay so this is this was an interesting stat so Washington is ranked so they are ranked as one of the of actually a lot better pass defense than their record would show and the way that teams have produced against them but against so against wide receiver ones so a, a team's wide receiver one, they are 22nd in the league against wide receiver ones on a team. But then they're third against wide receiver twos. They're like fifth against wide receivers in the slot. And then they're like eighth against tight ends. So wide receiver ones like Amari Cooper have been really doing really well against Washington when all the other receivers on the team have not been doing as well. Um so really what that means is Washington has a lot of depth at corner, but not as, they're not as top heavy. Um, so there, I mean, that's just a thing where that for me also puts Cooper a little lower for me. And I think, I think really what it is, is I just look at all these other guys have just more upside than Cooper, especially with Dalton and Dalton. I don't know. He just, and maybe, maybe it was just a rust thing because he hadn't been playing in we, the first week that he started so last week but I also think that I don't know it just looked he just looked it just looked off and he struggled and agreed that just concerns me about Cooper and I just worry and I maybe I've just been burned by Cooper in the past enough that there's this like worry that like that's just gonna happen again so <laughs> it's very bad. but also 15 is not low enough for us to like like that's still a wide receiver too like that means you pretty much should be starting him well, and most of that unless you have really good the wider, he might have been drafted though as like a wide receiver too, so it's pretty like reasonable, I guess, for a spot. Right. Um, but mine, I I had him ranked wide receiver one basically though. Yeah. Um, our next guy we should talk about is Allen Robinson, A. Rob. Had him ranked twelfth. You had him ranked eighteenth. Yeah. Well, so you say he's going to get covered by Ramsey in the comment section. Two words, Jalen Ramsey. All right, there it is. All right. So I had him ranked 12th, though, because Allen Robinson's a proven route runner. And going against Jalen Ramsey, Jalen Ramsey's been great this year. But Allen Robinson's also been really good this year. But he has struggled in the past against Jalen Ramsey. So that also concerns me. And so maybe I would move Allen Robinson down, but I do like how Nick Foles has been targeting them all. Well, yeah, and and that is the biggest thing. So uh, for the listener, Jalen Ramsey has allowed a 50%, 56% completion percentage to quarterbacks, uh, only 113 yards on the season. So he's only allowed 14 catches for 113 yards in six games which is insane. That's like that. He's been the best cornerback in the NFL this year. Um, however, what has been is saying is absolutely true. So Allen Robinson has also been one of the best receivers of the NFL this year from a target perspective. He is literally leading the NFL in target share. And he's also leading the league in, um, I mean, pretty much almost every, like a lot of receiver, receiver categories. Really the only person that is nudges him is Thielen on a bunch too. Um, but Allen Robinson's biggest, I would say complaint is that his yards per target and yards per reception are both pretty low. Um, but that isn't enough to say that you wouldn't start him. Um, and especially me putting him at 18 means that there might actually be some players you would start over him. 
my biggest thing, and so I own Allen Robinson in a bunch of leagues, as Ben knows. And I think really for me, it's just I'm gonna start him, but I'm gonna do a face palm while starting him because I just don't there is a huge worry that you're just gonna get a six point game from him and it's gonna be might. because oh sorry, what Ben? I said you might. Yeah, or a better way to say it is you're in a PPR league and you're only going to get 12 points because he's going to have six catches for 60 yards and that's it, which would be the best performance against Jalen Ramsey this year. <laughs> um, but there's just, in my mind, there's like Jalen Ramsey's a shadow corner and there's no way he's not going to shadow Robinson. And he's just been so good um that that just worries me and we have we've seen Nick Foles I mean he has no problems throwing at a 50 percent completion percentage in a game oh Nick Foles will just chuck up a bunch of stupid passes and I just I don't know I'm not confident in Robinson this week and I think the numbers show but Ben why don't you say why you are oh no you already did you said well I'm high on him because of his targets I think that like you're saying, though, Nick Foles does throw the ball to him. You know, like he targets Allen Robinson. Anthony Miller's not proven anything. Yeah. And, I mean, their rookie receiver, Mooney, he looked good. But I wouldn't say he's, like, at even, like, a close level to throwing the ball up to Allen Robinson, you know. Maybe they'll throw the ball to Dave Montgomery more this week. but And they have been since Cohen's gotten hurt. But I think Robinson, even if he's going against Ramsey, is – the guy that Nick Foles is going to be looking at almost every play. Well, and so here's, here's a cool stat too about what, because Ben just mentioned Darnold Mooney. And so we might as well put Anthony Miller with him. So um, this year, so Nick Foles is averaging, averaging 38 pass attempts per game this season. Okay. So Mooney and, and this actually might help your guys case about siding with Ben, not me on this one, but <laughs> Mooney and Anthony Miller are averaging only 9.3 targets per game this season together. Out of 38 passes. Out of 38 passes. So that means, well, and that, okay, that would be including Trubisky, but which Trubisky never targeted Miller. Um, But out of 38 passes, so that means there's 29 passes just sitting on the table that aren't going to Mooney and Miller. So that could mean two things. That could either mean go put Mooney or Anthony Miller in your lineup as a flex player this week because – Foles won't be throwing to Robinson because of Ramsey and will be throwing to those guys. Or that means that Robinson still is going to get 14 targets in this game. And really for me, all I'm saying, and and this is the difference with Ben and I on this one is I'm saying, I'm just concerned. He's only going to get, he's only going to catch six of 14 targets or Ben is saying, but that's 14 targets. That's worth a top 12 wide receiver play. So really either way is right. And maybe I am overthinking it, but. All right. Do you want to get to our tight ends? Yes. All right. So we have Dalton Schultz. I had him at six. You had him at 15. Like we said, they're going against Washington football team. And so they're actually really bad against tight ends this year. If you didn't know. Against like completions and yards. Well, they're they're eighth in um advanced stat production but you're right in actual like just basic production they have been bad against them yes so i'm curious as to why you put is it because of andy dalton (laughs) well so it's funny because he actually wasn't that horrible with dalton well especially in the tight end landscape right well Um, he had like a i mean you're not gonna sit him when he has like a six for 50 yard game i mean that's in a full PPR, that's 11 points, you know, from a tight end. You don't get that every week, you know, because like sometimes in a full PPR league, your tight end catches a ball for like five yards and that's it. Or last week, Cameron Braid had 1.3 points when everybody's like, oh, OJ Howard's out. Gronk hasn't done anything this year. Braid's going to be the guy, you know. You put Braid in your lineup, one point or one catch for three yards. That's all he had the whole game. 1.3 right. points. I mean – 11 points to 1.3 points is a big difference. And I think that even if like, even if he catches on like four balls, I think it's a good play. You know, I think Dalton Schultz, because he's going to be the guy that I think they're going to go to near the red zone because Dalton in his career has thrown to Eifert and, you know, in the red zone. 
So I think that Dalton Schultz, I mean, obviously I'm not going to compare him to Tyler Eifert in his prime, but Dalton Schultz, I think, is a pretty good tight end, viable. And I think he, against the Washington football team that's giving, it's 27th against tight ends this year, apparently, on rankings. I think it's mm-hmm. not a bad play. And I had him six yeah, there- because, I mean, I have him ahead of Tanyan and, like, Ebron. And, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, no. So, I, I think what you're saying is definitely accurate. And also, like, I just want to say, I'm not sure that he is worse than Tyler Eifert in his prime because all Eifert did was catch touchdowns. I don't know if he got hurt a lot. And he got hurt a lot. I think Schultz is actually a very good tight end. And I think we will see that in the future, especially. And granted, if you, I mean, you could even consider it this season. Well, right. Jarwin is, but they're also, they're both just good. But okay. So here's, this is my biggest thing. So without, without Dak Prescott, Dalton Schultz, has only produced five catches for 41 yards. Okay, so here's my thing. That still might put him better than a lot of tight ends. But for me, the problem is the upside. So I think if you need someone in PPR to just score you 10 points, which let's be real, in the tight end position this year, a lot of us need that. If that's all you need, I do think Dalton Schultz is a good play. Like you do have a floor with him. You can almost guarantee that he'll probably get at least five targets in the game. Okay, so with that being said, though, and there are other things, too, because Washington has allowed four different tight ends to score in the top 15 this week, this season, which is good. I mean, that's like a good thing for Dalton Schultz. But I am terrified of Andy Dalton just in general, as you guys heard when I talked about Amari Cooper. And I think that Dalton Schultz is good, but he's only had like a 9% target share since Dalton's been in the lineup, and that's not great. Um, and that just concerns me. And so really for me, he's at 15 because I believe in Austin Hoover this week. I believe in Gronk this week. I believe in Jimmy Graham actually probably every week now. And then the, and then also the next guy we're going to talk about too. So I think, I think more, more of Dalton Schultz ranking is that I just think that there's guys that have ceilings this week that are just much higher than his. That's a fair point. Yeah. Which the guy that we're going to talk about next, you have out of Schultz. And for a good reason, you have Darren Fells. I didn't have him ranked. You had him ranked at 11. Jordan yeah. Aikens is out with a concussion and an ankle injury. Right. Yeah, and, and honestly. You play this week. So it's funny. Before we uh, started recording, Ben actually said one of the biggest reasons why I have Darren Fells ranked where I have him. Um, so – Fells has scored eight touchdowns in the last 12 games. It's true. Him and Deshaun Watson have a good thing going. Um, so, but now here's a good stat. So Jordan Aikens and Darren Fells combined have had a 17% target share, which puts them at seventh in the NFL for tight ends. So then if you do the math, if you take Jordan Aikens out, that means that Darren Fells might not get a 17% target share, but even if he gets a 15, he's still in the top eight in the NFL in target share. So for me, that is enough to say that Darren Fells is a top 12 tight end, which makes him a tight so, end one this week. Thinking about it now, would you rank him closer up ahead or would you rank him down more? Like 15% if you're saying that. And that's top eight? Yeah. Well, it's eighth. If it's eighth? Yeah. Then, well, it might not be eighth this week. It could be. Well, right, right. Yes, it could be. Like, would you rank him closer towards, like, the one, or would you rank him lower because maybe Deshaun Watson's like, well, I don't have my two tight ends on the field now. I'm going to throw to somebody else. Because, like, Fells, what's interesting is he's a basketball player, or he was. And so he's really good in the red zone. But also he's been throwing the ball a lot to Will Fuller in the red zone. And I think that's where Darren Fells – but Darren Fells last week, didn't he have, like, 80 receiving yards? Yeah, he had 85 and six receptions and a touchdown. Did Aikens get hurt in the last game? Because if that's true – I think – I don't think he – 
Yeah. Or I don't know if he played at all. Really? Let me look. Hold on. Yeah, he didn't play. Okay, so that's maybe an indicator. And he had six for 81 and a touchdown, right? Yeah, six for 81 and a touchdown. That's a good week. 85, 85 and a touchdown. 85? Yeah, and he had that big 35-yard catch, too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and and that's I'm really that's where I'm at. Um, and I also think – I mean, think about who the Packers have covering tight ends – I'm, I'm not sure that tight ends can't produce against the Packers. Like, I think that they'll be fine. Yeah. And so I, th- I just, I think that there's just a bunch of things that kind of go, and especially like the tight end position just has been just bad. So you can't rely you, on anybody. You think you rely on one guy and then all of a sudden he just, he puts up a zero, you know? Right. Right. So, and especially if you're like someone that's streaming tight ends, like you, like Darren Fells is a great play. And realistically, like it's, I mean, it's Friday. So if you, like you've already done waivers, if you have Darren Fells, you already have him, but he's probably on a lot of waiver wires. So if you have someone like, and this is just from me, but if you have like Dalton Schultz, Austin Hooper, well, that's a different, but there's some guys that if you don't agree with, like if you're like worried about Tanyan or Ebron or Jared Cook, or even like Hayden Hurst, which you shouldn't be, but whatever. Um, but if you're worried about those guys, <laughs> Start Darren Fells because that's I mean he's a, he has a huge upside and the biggest well, thing Aiken's not playing. Um, what? Sorry, say that again. I said with <laughs> Aiken's not playing. With Aiken's not playing, right? Yeah, so that's that's the thing is Darren Fells just has a ceiling, and a, a big thing in fantasy is you don't just be like you cannot just expect regression just because someone had a big week because last week, yes, Darren Fells had a big week that was unexpected. And realistically you like, he probably will not do that every single week, but that doesn't mean that he can't do it two times weeks in a row. Um, And also if like Houston played well last week, right. I mean, and how, how often have they played well? Like never. (laughs) So if Houston played well and Darren Fells was a part of it, there's a part of me that says, okay, so, Maybe Houston figured something out. They have a new coach, like or well, they have a new coach calling or you know calling the shots. Yeah. So why not? Well, and Sean's passing the ball more, so maybe that that's where Fells is their guy. You know. Right. Yeah, and that that is my thing. So. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Listen to us talk, argue. If you liked it. Be sure to hit that thumbs up button, comment, see you in the next one, peace.